Welcome Faith Family Church. We're doing another panel discussion. Uh, Kyle uh, has had another great uh, sermon from the Ecclesiastes series. And as he kind of confided uh, earlier in the service, uh, he, he is realizing why so many pastors have saved uh, uh, Ecclesiastes for last. It's a mm -hmm. challenging book, but there's just so much good here. Uh, so much that soothes the soul, so much uh, uh, that uh, helps us get a good perspective on what life is all about. Well, today, uh, today's sermon had a big theme on sovereignty, and we know that it got a lot of folks think, uh, thinking because we even had several wonderful conversations after the services today about people that have some of those common objections about sovereignty. How can God be fair if he is completely sovereign over every aspect of life, including our salvation, whether we come to Christ or not? Um, what, is, what are the implications of that? Are, are we just robots, that kind of thing? And we've, we've had some wonderful, even just before, we had yeah. some wonderful conversations about God is just. And if God is not just or he is unfair, then the universe makes absolutely no sense. So we know that. We also know that he is, uh, uh, that all mankind deserves uh, punishment so that he would be completely fair to let us all go our own way, like Romans 1, just give, leave us over to our own selves, and that we all deserve punishment. We've all fallen short, even though we haven't all been as terrible as some others. And yet he has chosen in his sovereignty to show love to some, to glorify himself by showing mercy to those who, uh, through, his, his, uh, through the Holy Spirit, turn uh, to Christ from their sins. And that, again, there's a lot of difficult questions uh, that that raises, and it, it helps us really understand who God is in his fullness um, and even, which is frightening sometimes, but if we press on, as Kyle was, uh, was encouraging someone today, if we press on through that, we will have a better, more full picture of the goodness of God as well. Um, so I, I promised, uh, Kent, that I'd give you a chance to clean up my mess, but go ahead. There are a lot of uh, common objections that we have to sovereignty, and it can be a, a terrifying, fearful mm -hmm. uh, doctrine in many ways. What, what would you say to folks who are troubled by the doctrine of sovereignty? You're not sovereign. That's what I would tell you. Amen. Um, yeah, you're not sovereign. And I, I think, you know, experientially, um, the more that we try to control things in every single little event and moment in our life, the more we realize that we're not in control. And, and I think it's kind of, it's frightening to us because we want to be in control. We're, we're living in a culture that, that tries to have control over seemingly everything. We try to control uh, the political spectrum, the economy, you know, our children's lives, you know, just every little thing, our careers. And the longer you live, the more you realize that you're going to get curveballs that are coming at you out of the blue and stuff that you never even expected is going to happen in your life. And it's going to cause you to, to come to that recognition that, um, that you're outside of control and, and you are in complete submission to God's sovereign hand. I like that illustration that Kyle used about the ship with the nations kind of fighting against each other. And so if we can look back across the course of history and we can see that, you know, nations have risen and fallen, yet God was always directing and steering that ship, even leading up until the point in time when he was going to bring the Messiah to die on the cross. There was a specific point in time in history that was very, very unique. There was the, the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. All of these things happened and occurred at a specific point in time at, at, at the end of the ages, the culmination of everything that God had orchestrated so that the Messiah would die, so that he could ascend into heaven and intercede for people, but then also giving that peace in which the, the gospel was launched globally. Mm. So if he can orchestrate all of that to happen at the time frame for his son, he's still sovereign today. He's still sovereign over every aspect of your life and as the gospel moves throughout the world today. And look at it with a sense of confidence and a, and a recognition that, you know, as, as you realize that you lack control in a lot of events, but we serve a God that is in complete control. And we have to just grow in increasing um, confidence and hope and faith in that God that can control all things, knowing that he has our future. Mm. Amen. That's so... So that's good. It reminds me of a, a quote from, from Spurgeon. He said, the greatest, uh, the sovereignty of God is the greatest pillow. Absolutely. Uh, it's is. something that can give you peace. And that's what it is meant to do. I know I've, even from my mom's own experience, uh, she uh, grew up in the church and became a believer at a young age and grew up in a small church. But it wasn't until she went to Bible college that she really heard about the doctrine of election that God uh, chose, uh, chose us. And it was such a comfort to her to know that, in her words, it wasn't an accident that she came to trust in Christ. And that was a great comfort to her. And of course, that, as Kyle has been talking a lot about suffering today, 
That is what gives us uh, peace in the midst of a storm. Peace, having peace doesn't always mean that the circumstances of our life are going well. Um, as we know that, uh, for, yeah, that Kyle mentioned today in the Psalms clearly show that we can mourn. We can mm-hmm. uh, be honest with God about how we feel. But to know that a sovereign God, uh, if, if, as, as it says in Romans, if he's given us Christ, will he not freely give us every, all things, everything that we need in this life? So we can rest our heads knowing that, uh, that God is in control. And even the difficult things in our life, he has some good uh, uh, for us and for his glory in that. We might not even know in this life uh, what that, all that that was, but we can trust him. Because if he if he, if he saved our souls, we know that uh, uh, he has uh, nothing but good uh, for us. And that doesn't lead to complacency. We, it's okay to uh, you know, buckle your seatbelt to try to prevent accidents. It's okay to invest for retirement, have health mm-hmm. insurance, life insurance. It's okay to prepare uh, f- for these things. But as we do that, we, we do it humbly knowing that uh, God's plan is better than ours. and all we, There's only so much that we can do to prepare and to plan and be wise. And beyond that, we can just trust in, in the good, sovereign plan uh, yeah. of God. Amen. And, you, and you, now this is personal for you, Kent. Um, what are some ways that you personally in your own life have learned from the suffering that God has sovereignly allowed in your life? Mm. So I, I have to frame everything based off of a worldview of the fall. And so, you know, in Genesis chapter 3, with the fall of man, with the curse, uh, you see that Adam, that God tells him, by the sweat of your brow, you will, you will work through thorns and thistles for bread, that you will work, that you will labor all the days of your life. And also Eve had the curse that, um, she, you know, through childbearing, that she would bear the pain of childbearing. And so everything in life is going to be marked with pain and with toil. And the end state of, of all of our lives is going to be death. We are all going to die. So once we encounter suffering, there's a sense in which the suffering should cause us to recognize that there is something better that we are intended for, that there is a better hope, that there is a better place, that there is a better government, that there is a better father, that there is a better life for us, that all of this this, this muck, this mire that we live in today should press us to look for something better. And in doing so, you could say it you know, from an unsaved person, they should have a sense in which there's something wrong with this world. There's something fundamentally wrong with everything that is happening in this world, but yet I am called I, I, in, in, inherently that I'm created for something better, that, that, that God has created me with eternity in my heart that presses me for something better. So that should cause them to run towards the gospel, towards faith. And now Christians, we also are going to encounter suffering as a part of our sanctification. We're not just saved and then boom, you're going to go up to heaven mm-hmm. the next day. You know, there, there's a sense in which suffering is part of our, our conforming and growing into Christ's likeness. And the more that we suffer, the more that we encounter those things, the, the, the better that heaven looks, quite frankly. Uh, the more glorious that it looks. Uh, you know, one of the things that I have encountered in, in my suffering is it's good to have a, a, a great knowledge of Scripture, of the mm. biblical narrative, and to know Scripture, to know places you can go to. I mean, I like to go to Romans chapter 5, you know, where he says that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Mm. Uh, that's just a, a great encouragement for me to go back to in those moments yeah. when I am encountering suffering. Yeah, you, and you address really a, a one practical means of dealing with suffering that's so good, the Scripture and a knowledge of Scripture and a knowledge of God and His ways. And that's so important. You really need, in times of trouble, you, you really need to know uh, those important answers about who God is. And uh, it's really hard to do uh, really fast. I mean, uh, the, no, I, was, I was having uh, breakfast with uh, uh, one of my fellow brothers in Christ who was a little frustrated because he's like, he sees these people who have a lot of Bible knowledge, and it just seems so impossible to get there. But Bible knowledge is something that it doesn't happen. It's not like the Matrix. You just download the Bible app yeah. to your brain, and now all of a sudden you know spiritual kung fu. It's a gradual process, but one of, one of the many reasons we should do it is an act of obedience so that we can renew our minds in the Word. One of the reasons that we want to have that biblical truth in our lives and in our minds is so that we can help us in our, our times of suffering. Some other practical uh, means of making sure that you uh, suffer well, that you suffer for the glory of God, is to be part of a community. That's one of the many reasons mm-hmm. that 
uh, where, where the leadership here is so big on church membership, about church attendance, is that it's just important to be with other believers. It's, it's important to build relationships with them, both for just encouragement. When you're going through something difficult, share that with your pastors. Uh, we, love, uh, we as elders love knowing how we can pray specifically for you. Uh, ask for the prayer of other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes even people that you trust, Lay it all out there and get some, some feedback about like, hey, where am I at missteps here? What, what, what do I need to work on? I was sitting down with another uh, uh, brother uh, in our church who's going through a whole bunch of different things right now. And I assured him that that's not always the result of his sin. But when you're going through that, it's still a good time to, to check yourself and, right. and, and check, am I walking with the Holy Spirit? Am I holding on to things that are making, that I'm going to, because sometimes in those trials, we really should be relying on the Holy Spirit good times and bad, but sometimes in those difficult times we realize how much we really do need to, to draw closer to the Lord. So those are some, uh, obviously, prayer, uh, us praying uh, to mm -hmm. the Lord through those difficult times, praying scripture, having other people pray for us, seeking counsel through friends, as Kyle mentioned, which, mm -hmm. you know, fellow church members, best kind of friends to speak into your life there. Yeah. And then to just resist our natural reactions many times, whether it's to react in anger or in, in, in despair or bitterness, uh, but to, uh, to, to draw into God and to, to seek those answers from him. Well, uh, can, how are some ways that the, the suffering and the injustice we see in this life mm. is preparing us for the next life? Yeah. So, you know, as you look around and, and you see, we could say racial injustice, political injustice, injustice with the police, economic injustice, uh, there's injustice that happens all over this world. And it, it, it's a reminder to us that we're living in the fall, uh, you know, that we are living in a fallen, sin-marred world. And, you know, our, our souls are screaming for something better, screaming for justice. And I think as we stop and examine uh, justice, we have to recognize that, that the, the perfect justice, the perfect grace, the perfect love all converged on that cross in mm. Calvary. And so, you know, the, the justice that, that we have as saints who are born again in Jesus Christ was purchased by his blood. And from that, we know that God has prepared a better place, that there's a better home for us, that there's a, a, you know, a heaven where there is no sin, no death, no, no corrupt governments that we can look forward to. That's our blessed hope that we have as believers. Mm. And so no matter what happens, it's a light momentary affliction. No matter what happens today, recognize that it's nothing more than a, a blip on the screen. It, it is a small little drop in the bucket in comparison to the mountains of glory that Christ has prepared for those who love him. Exactly. That, yeah, so true. Compared to the weight of glory, as the, the King James and as great C.S. Lewis essay says. Uh, yeah, in this whole sermon, uh, I, I was struck when Kyle said, uh, you know, that, that is so not natural for us to see like, oh, our sufferings of this life in perspective of eternity. And Kyle hit on one that is very counterintuitive, you might say, is that uh, when, when Solomon says it's better to go to the house of death, mm -hmm. to go to a funeral, than to go to the place of birth. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's counterintuitive because one is definitely a happier occasion than the other. And, it just remi and, and so the, the big counterintuitive truth here, truth here is that it's good to grapple. And really, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is a counterintuitive. Let's grapple with the apparent meaninglessness of life just uh, if this world is all there is. And let us draw that to assurance in God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that it just, it's just a reminder that there are so many counterintuitive truths. At least they're counterintuitive from the natural man. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at life under the sun, as it says in Ecclesiastes, if our worldview is framed by just this earthly life, then yeah, it's going to make absolutely no sense to uh, want to use death as an opportunity to think about eternity. You're just going to want to live it up and party, uh, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many other counterintuitive uh, intuitive truths um, in Christianity, like the fact that it's important to acknowledge our sin rather than try to minimize it or to, to pursue our own uh, affirmation uh, above the, what it is humbling to realize that we have fallen short, that we have done wrong. Not just that we've made mistakes, that we're, we're weak, but that we have done what is wrong and deserve punishment. The Christianity says we need to grapple with that and not minimize it for our own uh, uh, self-satisfaction. Um, uh, 
that suffering can produce good things. That's counterintuitive, that there's a need to die to self, that death precedes life, um, that, that Jesus Christ was crucified and risen. That was just an appallingly counterintuitive and made absolutely no sense to the Jews and to the Gentiles of the first century, and it does even to this day. The Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the the world, whereas the dog-eat-dog philosophy of the here and now is that you've got to look out for yourself, look out for number one above all things, and then that there could be strength and weakness that the Apostle Paul is such a, mm. an example of. And that really is the, the counterintuitiveness of the gospel. So if you're listening or watching uh, today and you don't have the, the peace, that you, that you are troubled by this life and that you have no peace, no assurance of the next life, you can be drawn to Christ in the gospel, the knowledge that the, the, the sad news that you are sinful, that you deserve punishment, but that you can experience forgiveness. Christ took your place on the cross. He suffered so that he could give us glory and that he would be glorified. And that if we admit our sin, we, we turn from it, we rely wholly on what Jesus has done apart from our own good works, our own goodness, that he will save us. And then we can now experience meaning and we can embrace the sovereignty of God and, and, and let that be a joy to our hearts. Anything else to add there, Kent? Yeah, I, just real quick. I, I, I liked how you kind of tapped on that whole death and funeral. And so as you stop and think about that kind of counterintuitiveness that Solomon was saying that it's better to be at a funeral, um, it's a reminder you know, of our end state. And I think right now we're living in a culture that has been death sanitized. You mm -hmm. know, we, we, uh, we, we prepare our, our loved ones at uh, funeral homes that, that clean their bodies up and present them. Well, you know, you go back 150 years ago, we used to have parlors in our houses. Our old Victorian houses had parlors and you would present uh, your dead loved one in your house. And so there was a sense in which death was all around us. I mean, the mortality rate amongst infants was, was through the roof. We had diseases all the time. We, we lost people all the time. But, but nowadays, I mean, we really live in a, a death-sanitized culture. So we don't see it. We don't think about it that much. Mm -hmm. We've really taken away that fact. But, you know, as you encounter the thought of death, it should drive you to the cross. It yes. should drive you to the gospel, drive you to a recognition that that is our end state. And once you come to that, that realization, what are you doing with this life that God has given yes. you? Are you living it for yourself? Or are you, you know, abandoning yourself and throwing yourself upon the mercies of Jesus Christ and trusting in him, knowing that he's going to give you a better life where mm -hmm. there is no death? Yes, absolutely. And of course, this isn't a morbid fascination with death, but it is, it is a humbling and realizing, uh, again, that we're looking forward to something better. As uh, one of the scripture readings before the services today were from Revelation, that future hope of when death shall be no more. Well, Faith Family, we love you. We hope you're encouraged and continue sticking with us as we're uh, really um, uh, grappling with some important truths that if we, if we work with them will really give us a lot of peace and assurance and wisdom. Uh, we love you and we're praying for you.